So that movie, and there's lots of other interesting things about it to watch. Um, So that movie is titled Agora, and it's about Hypatia, who's considered by some to have been the smartest woman to ever have lived. Her father was a mathematician. The mathematician, by the way, that gave us the uh, a book by Euclid, uh, it was thanks to him copying it and saving it uh, that we still have Euclid, the elements. Um, they were at the library of Alexandria, which is, of course, in Alexandria, uh, where uh, Alexander the Great built a city in honor of himself. Um, but the library was also a temple uh, for Serapis, one of the pagan gods. Um, but so the uh, Christians took over the city. And by the way, it was St. Cyril, who was the bishop, who was the, the, one of the other characters there. Um, uh, and it's really kind of personal for me, because I grew up in East Lansdowne, Pennsylvania. And the grammar school that I went to was St. Cyril of Alexandria. <laughs> And of course, now as an adult, I realize that he's the bishop that basically encouraged the Christians in his, his city, maybe even uh, ordered them, to kill Hypatia. Uh, they took her and uh, stripped her skin off and laid her in the sun to die uh, in, in uh, Alexandria. So Hypatia was killed because she was an intellectual, because she was a teacher, because she was a Platonist, not a Christian. Uh, and there's a movie, by the way, that demonstrates uh, a true story, although, of course, the take on it, I think, and at the time it came out, was about the same time that George W. Bush was setting up the Allies to attack Iraq because of well, lots of different things, but, but basically this was a, kind of an interesting political maneuver to point out that back at the end of the Roman Empire, the Christians were the bad ones that were killing the civilization. Uh, and today we, of course, see the Islamists uh, doing the same uh, thing in uh, um, ISIS and other, other places, right? Um, so it was kind of an interesting political take on that. But at the same time, um, what's important here is, uh, and Augustine says this, that the, Cap the Catholics, the Christians, uh, um, have destroyed the pagan temples and have taken away uh, a lot of the pagan uh, um, culture and, and so on. They've replaced it with the Christian culture, right? So that did happen. And we look at Rome as falling. Actually, if you think about it, Rome never really fell. In fact, Rome is still a dominant world uh, uh, culture. There's, in fact, a flag to the empire right here in Eagle River over across the Glen Highway uh, out by St. Andrews, right? right? Um, St. Andrews? Anthony. Andrews. That's pretty bad, right? Um, right, the Roman Catholic Church. There's a Vatican flag. And if you think of it, the pontiff, the pope, is the pontiff. The Roman pontiff was the emperor, right? Uh, so you still have a Roman emperor, and it's Pope Francis, right? Um, so literally. Right, um, And by the way, when Rome was occupied and overrun by the barbarians, they weren't really barbarians, they were Christians who were mercenaries that had been fighting for Rome, being paid, and they eventually got to the point where they realized, why just take the money, let's just take Rome. And so they turned around and instead of defending the empire, they attacked Rome. And, and took the city multiple times, actually. 
but by the way, they were actually Christians themselves. So, so the, the culture of the empire actually continued, although there were, of course, drastic changes. Uh, did they support uh, the monasteries? Uh, in many cases, no, uh, and so on. Um, is this all fun? Am I, am I trying to do too many things at once? get back to my notes. So you could, you could read these notes if you're interested. Um, but so, what is the message that Jesus is giving us? That God is love, we should love everyone and not see evil in the world. And if we do that, we are saved. And by the way, there's a um, saying in the Gospel of Thomas where the apostles are asking Jesus, when is heaven coming? You know, where is it? And Jesus res responds, don't ask when heaven is coming. And don't ask where it is. Heaven is all around you now if only you had the eyes to see it. In other words, it's a conversion of our perception to recognize that all of this is good and that nothing is evil, and that's salvation, right? Now that's when you're saved, right? Um, and if you think about it from a Platonic, Platonic point of view, that brings us closer to the idea uh, of the ideas as existing now. And remember, Plotinus also had the argument that it, these were closer, that there was kind of a, a connection. Plotinus thought he had, at four different times in his life, reached a meditative state where he had become one with the universe, with heaven, right? Um, so that's, that's the meditative uh, technique, right, that we talked about, uh, where you can literally give up your have we talked about that? Um, remember, um, everyone has this part of their brain, apparently. Uh, Dr. Newberg, I think I mentioned, uh, um, argues you know, in the MRI scans of nuns and monks meditating that a little part of your brain turns on when you kind of close down your attention to inputs from your senses. And so you're basically able to meditate and become one with the universe, and, and I think we talked about drugs even being a possibility in that case, uh, but I mean, you don't need those, by the way. You can, you can do this with good training from a monk or from a, a Buddhist monk, whatever. Um, apparently all cultures have this ability, so it's a typical human ability. Um, but something else we didn't talk about, grace emanates. And that's an important feature of uh, Augustine's work. Um, and if we think about it, remember when we were talking about Plato and he described in his psychology that there were various types of people. Uh, there was you know, the folks that were primarily uh, attracted to the physical world. And they were the ones that really uh, um, loved physical rewards and things, and they wanted to be part of making things and so on. So they would become the workers, and their virtue would be temperance. Right? But out of that group would also then evolve, as they grew, uh, those that were more spiritual, interested uh, in society. And so their, their uh, virtue was courage being brave enough to go out and defend the community against enemies at great risk to their own life, right? You know, they were willing to give up those physical pleasures for the social rewards of love and honors and things of that sort, right? And their, their virtue is courage, right? And then the next group that would age out of that would be those that were primarily interested in knowledge for the sake of knowledge itself. 
those would be the wise, and wisdom would be their virtue, right? And there's fewer of them. You know? So the, the image you get is, is of this, this pyramid, right? With a smaller and smaller group. And trying to figure out, well, what makes the difference between this group and this and this, you know? And you get the impression that, well, this group has more matter and less soul. This group has a little bit of a balance of soul and matter, maybe. And this group has more soul and less matter. It sounds and, a lot like what people want to provide for society as they age. That too, yeah. Um, but there's clearly some people that have no interest whatsoever in moving into this category. They want to stay here. Beer, chips, football. <laughs> hey, Super Bowl, I watched the game, my one game of the year, and I did have a handful of Doritos. You know, I had a case of Bud, and I totally forgot. I never even had one. Shoot. Now i got to wait a whole other year before I get a chance. But so... So if you think, well, okay, so Plato gives us an explanation of this difference here, the psychological difference, through a kind of odd mixture of who gets more soul and who gets matter, right? Well, that's kind of matured now, and it becomes grace, right? So grace is given to people. And the grace comes from Jesus, from knowing about uh, his his sacrifice his life and wanting to emulate Jesus becoming a Christian yourself right and some of us get more grace than others it's almost just like this it seems to me but that's my interpretation of it right because who decides who gets more grace you know that doesn't seem fair and by the way this becomes an issue for a lot of sects because it is viewed as predestination. And so I, I have to ask, first quiz question for tonight actually. Do we have free will? Do you think people have free will? If you think about this, this is, from a scientific point of view, it's nonsense. Because everything that you decide to do is because of your genetic makeup, your environment, the way you've been taught. And so every event that occurs has a scientific explanation. We might not know all the details, but by definition, science has to say that everything that happens happens because of the causes of that exploit, right? We might not know why you decided to do this, but so if you're in a neighborhood and you end up you know, having your friend shot, and the next day you take your gun with you and you see the guy that shot him and you shoot him, you go on trial, and you admit you were the one that shot him, and you're defending yourself by saying, I had to kill him, or he would have killed me next, right? And then the jury is going to sit there and try to determine whether you're guilty or not. And if you've got folks in the jury that are Christians that feel like it's your free will that you shot that, that person, then you're going to jail. If, on the other hand, you've got a bunch of scientists sitting there, they're going to say, oh, if we were in his shoes, we would have done exactly what he did. So I'm not going to condemn him for doing what any of us would have done in his shoes, right? So the guy's guilty or not, depending on whether the people in the jury feel like he had free will or he didn't. It's not actually his, right? It's not his fault whether he's guilty or not. It's the jury. Depending on the culture of the majority of the jury, or all of the jury, right? So scientists will say, 
you do not have free will. It's a figment of the imagination. It's magic. You know, every, all this happened. You know, the bowls were rolling and knocking the next one. And then a miracle occurred, and the next one didn't get hit. No. That's, science won't say that. On the other hand, most of our laws, if not all of them, are totally useless unless we're convinced that everybody has free will and makes their own decision. So, which part of the jury would you be on? <laughs> which jury would you be? Free will, not free will. How do you explain it? So how does Augustine explain it? Remember, he's mad at Adam because Adam is blaming his own true guilt on Eve and on God, right? Because God gave him me instead of Lilith, right? We well, had Lilith first, right? But Lilith didn't behave. Did we talk about Lilith? Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting. By the way, it's McDonald that wrote the book Lilith by It's a children's story. Um, so how does Augustine explain it? Well, I don't know if this helps, but it gets down to time. I have the time. Might as well do it, right? Let's go look. So, Lord, this is from the Confessions of St. Augustine, book 11, chapter 1. I'm going to sk skip through some of this pretty quick. Lord, since eternity is thine, art thou ignorant of what I say to thee? Or dost thou see in time what passeth in time? Why then do I lay in order before thee so many relations, not of a truth, that thou mightest learn them through me, but to stir up mine own and my readers' devotions towards thee, that we may all say, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. I have said already, and again will say, For love of thy love do I this. For we pray also, and yet truth hath said, Your Father knoweth what you have need of before you ask. It is then our affections which we lay open unto thee, confessing our own miseries and thy mercies upon us, that thou mayest free us wholly since thou hast begun, that we may cease to be wretched in ourselves and be blessed in thee, seeing thou hast called us to become poor in spirit and meek and mourners and hungering and a thirst after righteousness and merciful and pure, etc., etc. So, so God knows everything. And how do we understand how that relationship that we have with God isn't kind of a back and forth relationship, very much like we have with other people, right? You know, so, so you ask me a question, I answer it. Now you know what I was thinking, and then I ask you a question, and you answer it. Now I know what you're thinking. And both of us have learned more about the other through that experience. But that can't be the way it works with God, because God knows everything all at once. In fact, when we get a little further, he asks, what was God doing before he made everything? Because God made everything all at once in a particular point in time, right? So people ask, what was God doing before he made everything? And he says, it's, it's hilarious. He says, he was making hell for people who ask such questions. 